Hello and welcome to the uh, Canon Chanter's Spare Bedroom for another one of our regular times of Biblical reflection and prayer. And it's a bit of a privilege today because we're going to look at uh, one of the more famous parts of the New Testament. And we're going to look at uh, what is known as the parable of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15 verse 11 to the end and this is the New Testament reading for morning prayer which is set for Tuesday uh, the 30th of June but as ever you can uh, read this passage and consider this reflection uh, at any time it's quite a long passage but uh, our conversation will make no sense at all unless I read it all to you. Then Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his eldest son was in the field and when he came and approached the house he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found.
one of the prevailing challenges I think of being a preacher or being someone who regularly commentates somehow upon the biblical text is that it's often the most familiar texts that we have the greatest difficulty with. When people have heard stories so often, what is there that is new that you can say about them? I'm going to uh, start by uh, using a good old clergy tactic and going back to an anecdote and remembering uh, my own time in theological college, which again is something that uh, clergy are rather over prone to do. It's a story involving uh, my college principal at Ribbon College Cudston, a man called John Garton. And John had taught at Lincoln Theological College, uh, had very much cut his teeth as a parish priest in inner city Coventry before becoming uh, principal at Ripon College Cudston. He would move on eventually from there to become the Bishop of Plymouth. He was uh, a considerable influence upon me and he had uh, some of the delightful eccentricities that perhaps uh, we don't see quite as often as we used to amongst uh, Church of England clergy. One of those eccentricities was that uh, often if you were in his office and you were lost somewhere in uh, theological or pastoral or philosophical discussion, he would be sat opposite you. Um, and one thing that he would do as the conversation progressed was he would often take off his wedding ring uh, take off his spectacles, uh, put the wedding ring on the arm of his spectacles and begin moving it up and down. As the conversation became more animated, almost inevitably, he would flick his spectacles and the ring would disappear across the room, uh, diving under a laden bookcase or a comfy sofa or an office chair. And your conversation would then continue with uh, the college principal on his hands and knees, crawling under a piece of furniture, trying to retrieve his wedding ring. And almost inevitably, of course, uh, having retrieved it, he would get back into his seat and after a while, the ring would be on the stalk of his spectacles once again. And the whole incident might just go and repeat itself. But I raise him, raise, uh, him uh, in this story, really, because he once asked me the very simple question, uh, asking a question of uh, somebody with a fairly fledgling Christian faith and an even uh, less rounded vocation. Alan, what does the story of the prodigal son mean to you? And I remember uh, saying to him, well, God's really not very fair. He looked at me uh, quizzically, slightly shook his head and suggested to me that I still had quite a bit to learn. I guess what I'd done is I had uh, seen the story completely from the perspective of the older brother and indeed you could uh, simply read the story in that way and see that uh, element of unfairness illustrated. But what I'd uh, really failed to do was to see the huge outpouring of God's grace in the life of the younger brother. I'd fail to see completely the capacity that God has to uh, forgive us. To forgive us for those things in life that often, if we're honest with ourselves, 
we find it very difficult uh, to be forgiven for. As my faith has gone on and my ministry uh, alongside my faith, then I have remembered those moments where I have really um, fallen short of what God might have expected of me. And it's in those moments, I think, that the glory of this story has been there. There, uh, in some way, uh, to rescue me and to tell me that in those moments where we do fall short, it's not really good enough for just to go and fall short again. But if we do uh, turn and realise uh, once again our brokenness, just as uh, the son did in this story, then you will find uh, the father waiting to embrace you again, despite the fact that you, uh, nor I, in any way you deserve that embrace or in any way have earned it. The story is fundamentally about God's nature as love and the outpouring of that love towards us in the forgiveness he can offer. During the time of lockdown, we probably have had more time on our hands to ponder. And it may be that in that pondering you have remembered some of those times that you regret where you have fallen short. I'm going to offer a, a litany now, a prayer simply saying sorry to God, reflecting upon those things. And I do so in the hope that both you and I will know once again in our lives the fond and wonderful embrace of our loving and forgiving God, who will embrace us once again in all our brokenness simply in the hope of what we might grow into and become as uh, his hands and voice in the world today. Blessed are you, Lord our God, we come before you to ask your forgiveness for all our failings, both great and small. Generous God, you give us many gifts in life. Yet sometimes we forget to share them. And so we say we are sorry. Pray for God you are with us in one another. Yet we sometimes fail to recognise you. And so we say we are sorry. God of gentleness, you ask us to bring peace to our family and to the world, yet sometimes we spread anger and trouble. And so we say, we are sorry. Gracious God, you give us a voice with which to sing and words to speak, and yet sometimes our words are hurtful and untrue. And so we say, we are sorry. Loving God, you sent your only son to show us how to love and serve one another. And yet at times we can be selfish and unloving. And so we say, we are sorry. Merciful God, as we prepare for reconciliation, help us to ask forgiveness when we need to. Help us 
to forgive others who have wronged us. And let us be peacemakers in our family and in our world. We thank you for your glorious gift to us of forgiveness and love. Amen.